a warm welcome to you. Uh, we're fortunate to have His Excellency, as does Ahmed Chowdhury, uh, with us at the University of Chicago this afternoon. Uh, he's speaking today, as my dear colleague Denise Morgan has said, in the Diplomatic Encounters series on an overview of Pakistan-U.S. relations. Now, uh, we've already heard about the Diplomatic Encounter series. I'd just like to point out that uh, this series was begun in 2015, and it was part of the university's celebration of 125th anniversary. So it's building on a very long tradition of connection uh, to the diplomatic world but let me make a few comments, particularly about South Asia. As many of you know, the University of Chicago's connections with South Asia long antedate the 1947 creation of Pakistan itself. From the university's opening in 1892, experts on what was then colonial India have held important faculty positions, especially since the mid-1950s, with the formation of the Committee on Southern Asian Studies, our intellectual engagement with the subcontinent has further flourished. Now, as one example, Mr. Chowdhury, you may be pleased to see here uh, an image from 1978. It's an image of one of your predecessors, uh, Sahabzad uh, Ayyub Khan, who was visiting the university and who met with uh, Professor Ralph Nicholas, who I'm happy to say is in the front row with us today. Uh, <laughs> Professor in the Department of Anthropology. <laughs> well, our distinguished guest and speaker, Mr. Chowdhury, is the 27th ambassador of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan to the United States of America, a position he began in March last year. A graduate of the University of the Punjab and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, he's one of Pakistan's senior most civil service officers. Among his most recent uh, postings, he represented Pakistan in the United Nations for more than six years in the early 2000s. And he was the ambassador of uh, Pakistan to the Netherlands from 2009 to 2012, an engagement that was the basis for his 2012 book entitled Pakistan, Mirrored in Dutch Eyes. Happy to say that that book is available in our collection, should any of you want to pursue further on uh, Mr. Chowdhury's comments today. Mr. Chowdhury comes to the United States in his current posting from his most recent prior posting as Foreign Secretary of Pakistan and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Islamabad. As Foreign Secretary's responsibility included directing relations with South Asian countries. Now, as you silence your phones, it's my honor to invite His Excellency Azad Ahmed Chowdhury to the podium for his speech. Thank you very much. I must commend and thank the University of Chicago for this opportunity and in particular uh, Denise who has been uh, instrumental in, in organizing such diplomatic encounters and uh, thank you very much for this introduction and thank you all for coming on a Saturday. I honestly did not expect uh, such an activity on, on a Saturday but when I got the news I of course uh, welcomed it because I think uh, one of my passions is always to interact with the younger the law, uh, especially in the academia. Uh, let me uh, preface my comments uh, about Pakistan with relations about what I see to be the world's state of play. Uh, let me propose a thesis to you uh, that the world, in my view, that we have come to know after the Second World War that order is going to see a big change now. Um, let me add here that the, the defining feature of this world order that is changing is 
the major power competition or rivalry that is emerging. What shape will it take? What will be the new world order? We do not have a clarity yet. Let me elaborate. In the last few months, the United States, which remains a preeminent power in the world, has uh, introduced a number of strategic documents which are very important not only for the United States but also for the rest of the world. I take you back to December 18th when the National Security Strategy of the United States was announced, where it identified that there are three clear letters of threat to the United States, the top of which is occupied by China and Russia, middle chair by North Korea and Iran, and the bottom by jihad organization. A month later, National Defense Strategy, which flowed from National Security Strategy, was unveiled by Pentagon, in which it was written for the first time that interstate strategic competition and not terrorism will be the primary concern for the United States. Again, it identified China and Russia as revisionist states that wish to change the status quo and displace United States in Asia. Then came President Trump's State of the Union address in which he even used the word rival for rising China and resurgent Russia. Of course, the Chinese and the Russians had their own views to say, so we could see that at the strategic plane, the interstate competition seems to be intensifying. Has it come as a news yet? Those of us who have been following these developments are not surprised, at least I am not. If I take you back to 2011, when Asia Pivot was announced by the then President, President Obama, It was largely perceived as a China contained policy. At that time, it would be felt that China was rising and some kind of new balance would probably be required. Australian, former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Root alluded to this by saying that the rise of China is like English Industrial Revolution and Global Information Revolution combusting simultaneously and compressed into not 300 years but The long-standing statesman of Singapore, the point who passed away a couple of years ago, stated that the advent of China on the global scene is not just another player but probably the biggest player in the history of the world, it would require a new balance. So we started seeing literature appearing on that, and we had Kurt Campbell writing his book, The Pivot, The Future of American Statecraft in Asia, where he called for a new rebalance in Asia. We also saw Richard Haas's book on the world in this array, that the world order is under collapse and a new world order is emerging, but it was not very clear where would it be headed. And then you have Graham Allison, who was a bit more pointed, and he wrote the book, which is titled Destined for More, where he predicts that China and the United States could end up in a, in a war, uh, provided certain, he's not predicting a war, but he's saying that, that they could end up in what he calls Thucydides' trap. You all heard about Thucydides' trap? This, this trap was coined by Mr. Thucydides, who was a general and a, and a historian from the Greek city states. When he was from Athens, when Sparta, which was the prevailing power, when they saw the city of Athens rise in power, it instilled fear in Sparta and both ended up in war. So he's saying the rise of China could, could provoke or instill fear in the United States and both could end up in war. And he goes back 500 years and identifies 16 situations. And
and studies them and he found that 12 of those 16 situations ended up in war. So therefore he's cautioning that if you want to be, uh, want to avoid such a conflict, then such and such steps have to be taken. So that's, that's the kind of literature which is started preparing. So it doesn't really come to you and to us as a, as a subtitle. Even Dr. Hendrik Singer, who uh, spoke before the Senate Armed Services Committee on January 25th, spoke about the that about the type of thing um, that he saw it is emerging and the world order that he saw was now uh, about to be changed. So what do you do with it? How, how do you handle this situation? President Trump in his State of the Union address felt that weakness is the surest path to conflict quote his words, and unmatched power is the surest means of diplomacy. A week before his address, Dr. Henry Kissinger, I think in that address that I just referred to, before the Senate Armed Services Committee was, had a slightly different approach to it, and I tend to agree with what he said. He said that in this age of admitted rivalry between these major powers, he recognizes that much. There would be a new balance of power. But then he doesn't stop there. He says that this balance of power, the challenge would be that it should not culminate in a conflict. Given technological developments, if it happens, then this would destroy. So he that while we may emphasize a lot on balance of power, we must place equal emphasis on diplomacy. To avert that kind of conflict which would engulf all of us. And hence, the efforts such as this are so crucial. You need more diplomacy. You know you need more such platforms to promote understanding so that people can begin to realize that conflict will will end up in a, in, a, in a situation which will be to the detriment of that. But is the world changing only in geostrategic terms? I think the change is far more complicated. I think it is also happening in other domains, in social economy. I'll give you an example. Free international trade, which we were told for centuries, was the best way and a win-win for everybody, and for which the world negotiated for decades through Canary Round and Uruguay Round and Doha Round is now under protectionist trend. We have seen the tariff wars between the United States and China, the United States and Africa partners, and the United States and Europe. Immigration, which for centuries was a method to infuse new blood into any society is now being viewed either as a security threat or an economic threat. Climate change, the global consensus on climate change is also in the question mark. And most of all, the narrow nationalism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, religious extremism, these are under, these are sort of there, that raising their ugly head. So the world is changing wholesale. Where would it end? We don't know. People have started predicting, but they're still not there. Even they're not ready to conjecture or not ready to even speculate because it's still in the process, in the, in the flux. Let me zoom into my region where my country is located, South Asia. The situation is not much different either. India and China what I, are in what I call as uneasy peace. India and Pakistan are not talking to each other. Afghanistan next door to us remains in deep turmoil. And Iran, the nuclear deal which was painstakingly negotiated for 10 years is also under question marks. And the broader Middle East remains in the grip of terrorism, country after country has been destabilized. 
So in its world which is changing and in a region which is still in the world, how is it that Pakistan has done? I believe in this circumstance, Pakistan has not done that. Our biggest challenge for the last two decades was the time segment. We were in the eye of the storm. And it was not something that we landed up suddenly. It grew out of the geostrategic competition of that time between the United States and the Soviet Union. When the Soviet forces came into Afghanistan 40 years ago, and the whole concept of Afghan Jihad was based. And when the Soviets left, Americans left, but these militants stayed back. And after 9-11, when Tora Bora was bombed heavily, most of them trickled to open forests, treacherous borders towards the tribal areas of Pakistan. And when Pakistan decided to join the US-led coalition, we became a legitimate target for all these militants. So from 2003 to 2014, all hell broke loose for the country. And we used to have terrible times, terrible attacks every day, 150 on the average per month until the nation said that enough is enough. And we began to challenge the militants. And a consensus was, was formed through a series of political conferences that violence and terrorism under any pretext was not acceptable. And that enabled the military forces of Pakistan to move into North Wazirstan, where all the militants had folded, made their training grounds, IED factories, safe havens, sanctuaries, and what have you. And within a span of three years, we have been able to secure the entire territories. This is not a small achievement. It came at a huge cost. Over 6,000 soldiers, 17,000 injured, 23,000 civilians. It was a huge cost to pay. But the nation was still happy that we have been able to secure the entire tribal area. The tribal areas which for centuries were kept deliberately without a settled governance by the British India and Russian Empire at that time during the 18th and the 19th century. Today, every inch of that territory has been secured. The militants are on the run. Some of them are, are hidden, uh, are hiding in our uh, urban centers. The others have fled towards Afghanistan, but we are. Uh, we have launched another operation called Dadul Fasad to sniff them out of the urban centers. So we think that we, 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 we did well under these circumstances. Countries next door to us in our broader neighborhood, we witnessed even half the violence that we witnessed disintegrate. But Pakistan stands taller and stronger from this crisis. And with better law and order, economic situation started improving and investors started coming in. Bulk of the investments came from China. But so did the Koreans and the and the Turks and the Europeans and now corporate America for the last one year is going in a big way to Pakistan because they can see that considerable investment has gone into energy and infrastructure. And now is the time for industrial industrial phase and therefore many of these investors are, are uh, are going to Pakistan. The democratic process in Pakistan is also deepening. The second elected government will be completing its term next month. And we are keeping, we are hoping that the elections will be held in time and the peaceful transition will take place. Our democratic process, unfortunately, has been interrupted four times by political intervention. But we are confident that this process will continue. People of Pakistan are discovering that it is noisy uh, by definition. All democratic processes are. But we think that uh, we are on the, uh, on the right course. Um, the fourth element I would point out for Pakistan would be the of Pakistan. We are a young country, more than 57% are below the age of 30. And that is an asset if we use them well and if they are well trained and well resourced. But it could be a liability if we don't do just that. So that's that's the kind of play that I want to lay down the context. Let me say a few words about Pakistan because the relationship now in that context. I believe that this relationship is a very important relationship for Pakistan. We have worked together for 70 years. We have been 
through very difficult times and come out with, uh, with successes and accomplishments, be it the 50s or the 60s or the 80s or the more recently 2000s when we were facing Al Qaeda. And if you don't hear or say, see Al Qaeda today, it's because Pakistan is there work together to decimate the organization that had caused 9 11. So we think that we, we still have a lot of work to do. The gains that we have made in Pakistan against terrorism, we know that they are at risk. They are tentative because Afghanistan next door is not stable. And we know that if Afghanistan is not stable, the instability will flow again towards Pakistan like it has happened in the past. And therefore, we believe that we want to see peace in Afghanistan. And we understand that for the United States too, it's an important area where peace must return to Afghanistan. It's been a long war for your country. And uh, you spent millions, uh, perhaps uh, billions, and therefore you would probably also like to say, see it stabilized. So the objective is the same. So we need to work together on that. We also need to stay uh, at the job that it was started, which is to eliminate all forms of terrorism. We know that Daesh and ISIS have come into Afghanistan. So it's is important for us to, to, to continue to work together. And it is a broad-based relationship. Sometimes this relationship, like what is happening now, is viewed very narrowly. It is sometimes viewed through one lens or the other. It is viewed through the lens of China. Perhaps we are very close to China, and therefore we should not be close to the United States. Sometimes it's viewed through the lens of Afghanistan, that Pakistan is not helping the United States and Afghanistan to, to, to compete and win that victory. Uh, sometimes it's viewed uh, through India, that India is closer to the United States now than it was, and Pakistan doesn't have good terms with India, therefore maybe it's not a good relationship, and so on and so forth. But I would say that uh, this relationship um, should be viewed at two levels. One is G2G and, and the other is P2P. I think G2G relationship, government to government, has vacillated, but P2P relationship, people to people, has always remained stable. And it has always continued, uh, mm. and in, in all domains, from education and health to commerce and trade to information technology to agriculture to defense to counterterrorism. So, name the area, and the two people have remained uh, connected with each other. The United States universities have remained a favorite destination for Pakistani students for decades. Uh, mm. Our physicians, thousands of them, have come and made this country their home. Um, our youngsters uh, working in the information technology, hundreds of thousands of them are uh, connected to Silicon Valley, either virtually or physically. So I think these connections have always stayed there. Agriculture, for example, the green revolution that came in Pakistan in the 50s and 60s was through a cooperation born out of UC Davis in California and an agricultural institute in Pakistan. And even today, there are leading some leading universities who are working with Pakistan in UC Davis. So these linkages give me confidence that and the resilience that this relationship, which is passing through a slightly no patch now, will come right back to the, to the normal state. And I'm very confident about it. I personally have spent a considerable top part of my career in this country. This is my sort of fourth state, my children grew up here. So I I have a very special association with this country. I know that this country stands for for a lot more than what appears. Um, I'm an avid reader of American history, and I, I think what your founding fathers did to you 240 years ago was the biggest gift that your nation could have received. The, the set of values that, that we gave to you, the values of democracy and freedom and liberty and the law and justice, I think this, this has what has kept the United States what it is and has made what the United States what it is. And these are exactly the values that people all around the world especially in my country here to, to own up and, and adopt. So uh, I'm very positively uh, inclined to believe that this relationship is there to stay. Uh, and we will need to iron out the wrinkles that have appeared at the moment. I'll pause here and let's we can talk about it. Uh, you have a wonderful audience. I, I saw you but it's very, very attentive. Thank you so much. <laughs> Much of that, Mr. President. Uh, we are going to be opening for this. Uh, uh, we'll be opening the floor for questions. 
uh, what I would like to uh, encourage people to do is to frame questions rather than having speeches. And um, I'll forewarn you that uh, if you are going on with the speech, uh, in the interest of having a larger number of folks here accommodated, uh, I will be asking uh, for a pointed conclusion to a question. Uh, using my prerogative as uh, the chair and the host, I'd like to begin with a question for you. And this relates to your important comment about the complications always in G-to-G -G relationships, uh, but the relative stability and positive characteristics of people-to-people -people diplomacy. I was struck just earlier this year by your foreign secretary's observation that the United States is a friend that always betrays. And um, unfortunately, or maybe as your duty, it's your responsibility to play in that role as a diplomat in an area where betrayals are an important characteristic. I wonder if you would address uh, the kinds of measures that you see yourself taking over the course of the coming years as ambassador to the United States to mitigate those uh, betrayals or the consequences of those betrayals. Uh, thank you for this question. And the, there are some people who are skeptic about uh, our continued relations with the United States. And there are people who feel very strongly that the United States is a great friend of Pakistan, has contributed towards Pakistan. I believe the latter is a much larger potent force in Pakistan. I also see that within the United States, there are people who feel that Pakistan has not come up to its own expectations. You know, the president of your country issued a tweet, which was also indicative of, uh, of the misgivings about Pakistan. But then there are people who don't agree with that approach and who believe that Pakistan and the United States have work to do and can work together. Uh, the, the reasons um, for, uh, for this oscillation or oscillation in the relationship could be several. Uh, I would count some for, uh, for you and for the audience. There's a mismatch of expectations. Uh, in, in, it's a cultural thing. In Pakistan, uh, people believe that if you have a good relationship with somebody, it should earn you enough credits to see you through the shallow, shallow patch. A friend in need is a friend in need, that kind of thing. It actually doesn't work on that thing. It actually works on the basis of national interest and how we see this national interest. And therefore, the United States coalitions to further its national interests keep changing. So it's not a question of, uh, mm, you know, mm, uh, complete commitment and loyalty all the time. Uh, I think they, uh, this is one. And the second is that uh, bulk of the relationship has also been concentrated on the security division, where the invisible drives the real. Uh, mm, both sides, then people have to look towards their respective security establishment, uh, where information is not that much available. So the relationship moves in the in, in, in the sort of realm of little or no information, and that also creates this misgiving. Uh, we have also seen that uh, a donor recipient relationship also sometimes hurts. Uh, because when a country is donating something, then it generates an expectation that the recipient would, would then respond according to the expectation. And when those expectations are not met, then the, there is a frustration. And on the recipient side, they, it is felt that perhaps the donor wants to use its money and wealth and power to, uh, to dominate us. Uh, so that's uh, uh, another reason. There's also a strategic culture in the United States of strategic leaks uh, through the media. And therefore, when the, when the issues move into public domain, they are more difficult to handle. Uh, the, the difficult issues are generally done through private conversations between diplomats and political leaders. Uh, and uh, 
uh, now in this defining age where uh, information explosion has already occurred, uh, public much of it happens in public domain, and therefore you just quoted one tweet from one of the uh, leaders in Pakistan, and I just quoted also a tweet from the president of this country. So when you take these matters into public domain, it is difficult then to control uh, the state of relationship. So therefore, it has it has uh, vacillated for a long time for uh, G two G. But on P two P, that's not the case. In P two P, it's it's a it's a much more entrenched kind of interaction between the people of the United States and people of, of Pakistan. And even now, to give you an example, for the last one year, when our relationship with, with the US government is, is passing through a, a shallow patch, the corporate America is making up its own mind and is going in big numbers. Why and how? I think because they see that there is, uh, there is a good, good potential for profit in Pakistan, and uh, that's why they are doing it. Similarly, on, I, I will give you an example on agriculture and many other areas. In fact, our bilateral trade this year has hit an all time high, has actually grown. Uh, so, uh, I think these, these linkages between the two, two peoples are there, and they are strong, they are less noticed because uh, the government. Government relationship is what attracts more, most of your attention. Thank you very much for your thoughtful comments here and, of course, for your remarks. I particularly appreciated your setting the context of changing world order. Uh, so, there may be questions uh, that will come from the floor here, uh, either related to the larger issues of world order as it's reforming itself or the specifics. Uh, Pakistani US relations. France and Germany were at war for centuries, but then with the European Economic Community and the success of the European Union, there was a framework for liberal trade, which also kept a great degree of peace. So I wonder whether that might be a long-run vision for how India and Pakistan and other countries could uh, live in more harmony. Uh, that might not be Xi Jinping's objective with the Belt and Road Initiative, which might have a more mercantilistic turn, but one could imagine even giving that and including China in a more liberal uh, economic community in South Asia. I wonder what you think of that. Thank you. There are two thoughts, but let me first address only the, the first one, which is uh, India-Pakistan. Uh, the model that Europe has uh, followed, and I think some other regions are also following, like ASEAN, is a model that has been suggested also for Pakistan, India, and other countries in South Asia. Uh, the unfortunate part of uh, Pakistan-India relationship is that the deep mistrust has stayed with the two countries since 1947, uh, because of the circumstances in which partition took place. Uh, mm, there have been attempts to ride over that. Uh, mm, I agree with you that uh, uh, trade is a great peace consequence, peace builder. Uh, mm, but the security dimension has, has uh, dominated the relationship. The, the acute sense of insecurity in Pakistan that India might address it this way. Uh, that has somehow defined this relationship. Um, we, uh, instead of going into history, let me just come to, to present day situation and why the two countries are exchanged. Uh, India believes that, uh, um, that Pakistan has certain elements, non state actors, uh, who commit terrorism in Pakistan and come back in safe abodes in Pakistan. So that's India's complaint, and, and, and our answer to India is that uh, whenever we want to talk to each other, and we see some militants get up and do bad things, and you immediately suspend the dialogue, and thereafter these militants sit back and relax until we make another fundamental effort to come together and make bring into action. So why not change this track? Why not the we keep talking? And 
we isolate together these militants because these militants are non state actors who, as I said, were a product of Afghan jihad and for 40 years have dug their boots in terms of uh, charities and, and, and other activities. And we need to, they, they, these non state actors are no friend of Pakistan, no friend of India, no friend of uh, the peace in the region. And therefore, we need to work together and talk, keep talking. So that we isolate them rather than they dictate uh, the terms. So this is one element. The second is that of late, when US uh, announced its Asia pivot uh, uh, and had a very close relationship with India, which has now assumed greater strength, it seems to have, and you know, comparing it to the time when the United States used to maintain a balanced approach towards South Asia, this still is and uh, has seems to have encouraged the present regime in India to try a heavy-handed approach. So they have done so in Kashmir. They are also uh, doing so in about Pakistan, uh, not talking to Pakistan at all under, uh, under certain conditions. And uh, I think uh, uh, these two factors have uh, made it very difficult to move to the case that you are you rightly, you rightly marked. I think in 1952, and Charles de Gaulle walked up to the country which had marched his troops on Champs Elysees. It was a great leap forward for that. And I think some kind of vision leadership would be required for that kind of peace in, in, in between Pakistan and India uh, because the peace will deliver so much to both countries. So, just a matter of time, we uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for being here, uh, Mr. Ambassador. I have uh, two, two questions that are unrelated, but maybe related. Um, what is Pakistan doing to withstand pressure from Saudi Arabia to align itself um, against Iran? Because it has been done, like, for example, Rajal Sharif has joined the is the commander in chief of the Islamic uh, life, which very much is seen as uh, as not an Islamic army, but it's, it's, it's Saudi Arabia's uh, fight with Iran. So, why is Pakistan being, being involved in that kind of uh, relationship with Saudi Arabia? I know it has done successfully in the past not uh, to not participate in its uh, fight in, in Yemen. So that's one one question, um, and uh, and actually that at the cost of relationship with Iran, which you mentioned earlier. So why would Pakistan make such a decision when Rahib Sheikh should take that position? And then the second is, um, what is Pakistan doing to, uh, you, you mentioned that Pakistan is a young country. So what is Pakistan doing to, to improve uh, or to invest in human development and uh, uh, extreme influence in Pakistan from, let's say, uh, external extreme education in, in Madrasa? And what is Pakistan doing to, improve and as the for that so that in the next 10 20 years the young generation will come up with uh, an enlightened religion thank you so much okay thank you for your questions uh, saudi arabia um, is a very close country for pakistan has always been is home to two holiest shrines of for the muslims uh, for muslim world uh, and for the people of pakistan uh, it has over 2 million Pakistanis living and working in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and Saudi Arabia has always supported Pakistan throughout uh, the history, and therefore we have very close ties with Saudi Arabia. Iran, on the other hand, is a neighbor and has had a deep Persian imprint on the culture of Pakistan, not only in Pakistan, but the entire Indian subcontinent. Um, and therefore, for Pakistan, it has always been painful to see uh, uh, these two countries uh, have a tense relationship. Uh, we have always urged both sides to uh, not to land in a situation which would be active life conflict, because that's going to hurt uh, these two countries and the Muslim world. Both countries are leaders of the World, very important there. And therefore, that's the role Pakistan has always played. Uh, Pakistan does not take sides because we cannot afford to take sides. We also have a sectarian mix in our country. Uh, 
Um, we have Sunni population, which is the majority, but we also have a Shia population. And therefore, we all, always believe that, uh, uh, that our relationship with Saudi Arabia and Iran should always be a balanced relationship. Um, and we have participated in Islamic military alliance, but if you notice, the name of that alliance has been now changed to, uh, to a Muslim, an alliance of Muslim countries to counter terrorism. It has been focused only on terrorism. Uh, and, and we believe when we have said so that if there is ever any threat to the territorial integrity of Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, the people of Pakistan will stand shoulder to shoulder with the people of Saudi Arabia. So that aspect for us is, is very, very clear. But we certainly don't want to take any sides. And we certainly don't want these two countries to have any kind of conflict. The, the human development part is important. You are absolutely right. Uh, and within that, you mentioned education. I think education is uh, and should be the primary focus of any government, my government included. Um, we have had the difficulty of, uh, um, again, a byproduct of Afghan Jihad, when we have uh, still uh, several thousand madrasas in Pakistan. Many of them have reformed themselves, but some of them are still involved in extremist activity. So therefore, we launched a national action plan, which was focused primarily on um, addressing that mindset, which gives rise to extremist behavior, and some of which is germinated in these madrasas. So therefore, um, that that is a job, that is a work in progress. Um, are we there yet? No, far from it. We, we, have, we still have to go a long way. And I think it is also incumbent on, on the people of Pakistan uh, to continue to raise their voice for human development uh, for themselves and to find their governments uh, that they attach the highest priority to this particular area. There are enough good people here in this country who are also voicing the same, and there are enough good people in Pakistan who are voicing the same. And probably as an ordinary citizen of Pakistan, I would also feel much more empowered if my government pays more attention to the social sector uh, development in Pakistan. So my question is that, like, um, you said that there is no ter terrorism in Pakistan. So I'm Pakistani, but I saw people getting killed. They're getting kidnapped. Why doesn't the government think about that? Why doesn't the government, like, you know, help them? They don't even give money. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you heard me, uh, you would have noticed that. Uh, I explained the situation in which my country got landed due to geostrategy rivalry of that time. And we suffered. We suffered. It was not our war. There was a big debate within our country whether it is our war. Until five years ago, there was a religious party whose leader felt that soldiers of Pakistan are, Pakistan are not martyrs and Taliban are. It's a matter of record until people got together and when innocent children like you studying in Peshawar school in December 2014 were mercilessly killed. That's where the conscience of the nation was shaken and everybody came to it to get to, to the conclusion that militancy and terrorism and extremism of any form is not acceptable. And I think we have come a long way now. We've come a long way and Pakistan has reversed this tide of terrorism at a time and in a region which is still grappling with it. And I, I cannot agree more with you. There should, no, there should be ID, there should be no terrorism at all. There should be no killing. And that's the aim that we are trying to pursue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, thank you so much for being here. With pleasure listening to your thoughts. Um, my question is um, in the context of the Chinese influence in Pakistan, particularly given the investments with CPEC, 
And you mentioned um, the uneasy peace between China and India and the admitted rivalry between um, China and the US. So in that context, I just wanted to ask how you envision Pakistan balancing ties between these three countries, particularly given that um, often their interests in the region don't overlap. Uh, China has been a very close friend of Pakistan, has always been, but this has largely been a political relationship. It is only recent times that we have seen the political goodwill translate into economic progress. So we, we have the China-Pakistan economic corridor which has emerged. We have to see the genesis of how this is, because the idea has been around since early 90s. Why is it that it has happened now and not before? When President Xi uh, came to power in China in 2013, uh, he changed the model of development and growth in China. And he shifted from the growth-led model, which was overheating the economy uh, to 9 to 10% of growth rates, to mobilization of domestic consumer market and developing the regions which are not developed. So that took him to Western China, which was far less developed than Eastern China. So he started making investments there. But the problem was that any product which was produced in Western China had to travel 5,000 kilometers overland to Eastern China, where all the ports were located, and then go around another 8,000 kilometers through Malacca Strait and Indian Ocean, come to Red Sea or the Persian Gulf, uh, or the Gulf. Uh, and that's where uh, you know the idea came that perhaps it might be a much shorter route to go from Western China through Pakistan to Gwadar. Uh, the distance between Kashgar uh, and Gwadar is 2,000 kilometers, which is 11,000 kilometers shorter than the other route. And that would make perfect economic sense for Chinese to think of this project. For Pakistan and Pakistani leaders also, it became a very important project because the western part of Pakistan is far less developed than the eastern part of Pakistan. And this route was passing through Gilgit Baltistan, KPK, northern areas, and then through the Khuzistan part. So it made perfect economic sense for Pakistan also to go for it. And we did. Um, investments have come into it. Um, some countries may not be happy about it. Uh, but I believe that in due course of time, this corridor should blossom east and west. In fact, in west, probably Afghanistan will be the first beneficiary of this because if you go up north from Kavada, uh, the very first stop actually is, is the, uh, the Kandahar province of Afghanistan, and therefore they will be direct beneficiaries of this. Central Asia are very excited, so they all kind of came to Pakistan, their leaders on 1st of March last year. And they were very excited because they have been landlocked for a long time. So they see this route to be used by them for their imports and for their exports. In fact, they will connect, it will connect to the Eurasian landmass. I believe that in due course of time, if our personal relations with India also improve, probably this would become a, a main artery for use by India as well. Um, India has its own objections to it. Um, India has its own equation with China and has registered with its, its opposition uh, to uh, not only China-Pakistan economic corridor, but also Belt and Road Initiative. Um, that is for India and China to sort out. Uh, we believe that connectivity uh, in Asia, which has, been, which has been the continent, which was the least integrated continent, uh, is a great blessing. Uh, I believe that every avenue of connectivity should be supported and expanded because it will bring prosperity to the people, regardless of the politics involved. The Belt and Road Initiative, for example, touches 68 countries uh, from Asia and Europe, um, and I think it will benefit so many, uh, so many people. Um, I I believe and I hope that uh, uh, China and India will settle their own issues. The China Indian Prime Minister was in. In Beijing yesterday. Uh, I hope that uh, China US rivalry uh, and India siding with, uh, with the United States and Pakistan siding with China, this kind of alignments will not sharpen. 
I hope it doesn't go in that direction. 40 years ago, when two super fast called Soviet Union and Pakistan, United States, Pakistan sort of suffered, Afghanistan suffered, we came in the vortex of it. And this time around, if the same is to happen, we don't want to be there again. So we believe it's about time, like I said in the initial parts, like Dr. Henrik has also advised us in this same voice that we need a lot more diplomacy than these specific Thank you. Thanks so much for being here and speaking to us. So in your address, you mentioned that the, G, the G2G relationship between Pakistan and the United States can sometimes be strained a little bit, especially given when the governments of the United States and of Pakistan start releasing things. So instead, the relationship mostly relies on P2P. However, given the uh, large wide-scale rise in the United States of nationalism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, and perceived security threat from overseas, how can you be confident that the P2P relationship, which appears to be the backbone between US and Pakistan relationships, will maintain, especially given the additional strain under the Trump administration? Thank you. Uh, it's a good question uh, because the forces that you mentioned are here in the United States as well. But the United States is a late arrival to see these forces. They were already prevalent in Europe, for instance, and in and other parts of the world. Um, the world as a whole will have to grapple with them. Just see the situation the other day I was watching this uh, serial genius about Albert Einstein's life when he was in Germany and they were showing the period of uh, you know, the two world wars after the first world war the forces of or the concept of na nationalism was rising in, in Germany and you could see uh, that Einstein and others were getting uncomfortable about it. But it was a very quiet debate. And slowly and gradually it shows how it gained momentum until Hitler came to power and he rode the wave of that. So we have to be really very careful about it. And that's why I, I use the word narrow nationalism. Because narrow nationalism is antithetical to globalism. This world has become far too connected than to be divided again. Uh, remember that book uh, by Tom Friedman, The Flat World. He thought that this is not a flat world. Uh, there was a time when Soviet Union and the United States, the Cold War ended and there was a euphoria and, the, and there were mega conferences in the, in the United Nations um, from child to women to environment to habitat. Uh, and there, there was an attempt to build a socio-economic global normative framework for the whole world. The world was actually moving in that direction. Unfortunately, uh, this, these trends are a departure from that. But my, my sense is that this is more of an aberration than the ultimate direction. Uh, there is a big risk. There is a risk that if we don't stem these forces in my country, in the United States, in Europe, elsewhere, then the world as a whole will suffer because we are far too connected. So one, if one part of the body will hurt, the other will also hurt. Therefore, it is extremely important that we don't succumb to these forces. And the people-to-people -people context actually should be used to overcome these, these many, many, many forces. Um, I, I hope, I cannot say whether it will happen, but I surely do hope that uh, that would be the case, not only for Pakistan, US, but for the United States relationship with almost every other country, because it's a country of independence. Thank you. We're gonna have time for we have time for one more question before we're going to break. And uh, as you may have noticed coming in, uh, there is food for a reception and an opportunity for informal conversation following this more formal part of the presentation. So one more question. Uh, hello, uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I so you, you talked about how America's tilt towards uh, India at the moment is preventing the achievement of a peaceful solution between India and Pakistan. And you also talked about how China's relations with Pakistan at the moment are a lot more friendly than China's relations with India. Uh, would you believe that this, that China's tilt towards Pakistan would 
also be having the same effect as um, what we spoke about with regards to America and India? Russia has announced two strategies, national security strategy and national defense strategy. It is about to announce another strategy, which is called Indo-Pacific strategy. The objective of that strategy is that the challenges that arise from the Pacific Ocean and Indian Ocean should be integrated or dealt with in an integrated approach. Some people are worried that this approach could lead to sharpening of the alignments that you spoke about. The alignments of US, India, China, Pakistan. That would be disastrous for our region. That would be disastrous for the whole world. And that is why it is extremely important that we go to, don't go that way. It might well happen. I'm not saying it won't. It might well happen. But I think the, the world must realize that in the last decade or so, the world has also discovered another phenomenon, which is that you have issue-based coalition. On a particular issue, countries A, B, C are allies, and on another issue, countries B, C, and D are allies, even if A and D are enemies. So there is a there's a, there's a issue-based coalitions which are which are being formed, uh, which could also be uh, one way to counter these. Uh, alignments. Um, honestly, I don't know the answer. I hope not. I hope we don't go in that direction. And that is why I have been arguing a lot here that Pakistan should have good ties with the United States. Pakistan should have good ties with, the United, with China. Pakistan's relations with China and Pakistan's relations with the United States should not be a zero sum game. That we want equally good ties. That we were a bridge for China, Pakistan, United States to China 40 years ago. We are that bridge even now. And so it is in that direction when corporate America started going to Pakistan, I felt happy about it. Because like somebody asked right in the first day, if you have investment, if you have trade, this is actually a great uh, uh, peace uh, project. So I, I, I sure hope that uh, the world would uh, realize how, I don't see that awareness as at the moment. Uh, people have really not paid that much attention to how the world is changing, uh, but uh, um, but there are enough sane people, as uh, Abraham Lincoln said when he wrote a letter to his son's teacher, that teach him that for every enemy there is a friend. Teach him that not all men are just, and not all men are true, truthful, truthful. But for every scoundrel, there is a hero. So I am banking on those heroes. And there are enough of them in this country, and there are enough of them in my country and other countries who would see the wisdom of win win solutions rather than these alignments that you just spoke about. Thank you. Before we join you in the assembly hall, I have the opportunity for a brief conversation with Ambassador Chowdhury. And at that time, you shared with me the prospect of a book forthcoming. Uh, you're working on a larger statement based on uh, your career and also your experiences. I know, based on what you said, shared with us today, that we have something important to look forward to that's going to address questions on the global order. Uh, of course, the uh, to the uh, Pakistani and U.S. relations, and also those things that link into the South area. So we look forward to your book. For now, we'd like to thank you very much for being with us, and uh, we look forward to an informal conversation with you over a repast here. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I, 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 I must say that uh, uh, this country, uh, the United States uh, remains a global leader. I think it has shown global leadership. It has shown that what is it, that it has a lot more to offer to the world. Uh, uh, and therefore, my country is deeply interested in maintaining ties uh, with the United States to strengthen it. I'm a little surprised that nobody asked about Afghanistan, but that's fine because I tweet about it all the time. Um, uh, so God bless you all.
God bless America and God bless Pakistan. Thank you.